Story 1. There's something wrong with my sister. I can still remember it as if it happened yesterday, even though it's been decades. Halloween night in our small, quiet neighborhood was always a special occasion. The anticipation of dressing up and collecting candy was enough to make any kid's heart race with excitement. My story happened back in the late 90s. I was just a young boy back then, and my older sister had promised to take me trick-or-treating. Little did I know that this Halloween would terrify me for years to come. We headed out just as the sun was about to set, and I remember there being an electricity in the air. I guess part of it was excitement, and part of it was fear, because I was still a little boy, and could still get scared quite easily. My sister dressed as a witch, and had the entire outfit head to toe. She even had a witch's mask, with the pointy nose and everything. She held my hand tightly as we knocked on doors and yelled, Trick or treat! We went door to door, and I scooped up as much candy as I could get my hands on. About 45 minutes in, we got separated for a brief moment. When I finally caught up to her, I asked her where she had been, but she just looked at me. I didn't think much of it, and grabbed her hand, and we continued going door to door for about 15 or 20 more minutes. As we continued trick-or-treating, something felt off about her. She wasn't speaking much, and her movements were just weird. Honestly, I thought maybe she saw somebody she didn't like, or saw a boy she did like with someone else or something. I honestly didn't know. When we returned home, she was still acting weird. My parents were in the garage handing out candy, so I ran up to them and showed them how much I had gathered. My sister just kind of stood around and didn't talk. My sister had always been full of energy, but something was up and she was eerily quiet. Her and I went inside and left my parents to finish up handing out candy. My sister moved slowly into the kitchen. I remember her taking really slow steps and just looking around it was so creepy. I went into the living room to tend to my candy. I was snacking away, just eating candy when I asked my sister if she was ever going to take off her costume. At least take that hideous mask off. When I didn't get a response, I turned around and she was standing directly behind me just staring at me, motionless. At this point I was part creeped out and part annoyed. Part of me told me that she was really going the extra mile to creep me out, and the other part told me that something was really off. Just then I could hear some loud talking coming from the garage where my parents were. I turned back around, and a few seconds later they bolted through the door. Looking part terrified and part panicked, they looked at me and asked who was with me. I was confused, and gave them that kind of look like, what are you talking about? Just then, my sister with her mask off, walked in behind them. My eyes got really wide and I was so confused. I turned around and whoever was behind me that I thought was my sister was gone. In the kitchen, the door that led to the backyard was wide open. My parents were in a panic and started searching all around the house. Whoever it was, was never found. What's even creepier, is that we later found that a knife was missing from the knife block, and we were never able to find it. To this day, I tell myself that it really was just my sister, and she had just snuck out the back door and came around to the garage. But she swears it wasn't. She said that she lost me and couldn't find me, and so she just came home, and that's where she found me. There are still so many questions, though. If it wasn't my sister, who the hell was it and what were their intentions? If it wasn't her, how was it then that whoever it was could have had the same exact costume that my sister was wearing? Where in the hell did that knife go? As a grown man now, it's a mystery that still gives me chills to think about all these years later. Story 2 a terrifying intruder story. The morning sun filtered through the blinds, casting a warm, golden hue across my room. I stirred, feeling the weight of exhaustion pressing against my eyelids. Something wasn't right. My stomach churned and twisted, an unfamiliar ache signaling that today wouldn't be a normal school day. I mustered the strength to sit up, the sheets tangling around my legs as I swung them over the side of the bed. The floor felt cold beneath my feet, and my head was spinning uncontrollably. As I stood, I paused for a moment, swaying unsteadily. The thought of facing a day at school seemed impossible. With a heavy sigh, I trudged downstairs, my steps dragging like lead. In the kitchen, I found my mother preparing breakfast. I mustered the strength to tell her I didn't feel well. 
She looked concerned but understanding, telling me I could stay home for the day before she left for work. I considered a slice of dry toast, but my queasy stomach protested even the thought of food. As my mother's car backed out of the driveway, I retreated back to my bedroom. I settled back onto my bed, wrapping myself in a cozy blanket. The TV played in the background, its murmur of voices providing a dull comfort. I tried to lose myself in the screen, hoping to forget the discomfort coursing through me. Minutes turned to hours, the day outside drifting into a muted gray. I was cocooned in the quiet of the house, the only sound my own shallow breaths and the faint whisper of the TV. It was then that I heard it, a slight bang that jolted my senses. I couldn't discern its origins, whether it came from inside or outside. My ears strained, desperately trying to capture any other sounds. At first, there was nothing but silence. But just as I began to relax back in, I began to hear faint creaking from below, like footsteps on the wooden floors. My heart quickened, beating a frantic rhythm in my chest. My eyes darted around the room, searching for some logical explanation. Maybe it was just the house settling, but the unease in my gut told me otherwise. I tiptoed to the edge of the staircase, peering down into the emptiness below. The air seemed colder there, carrying an unfamiliar tension. My fingers gripped the banister, knuckles turning white as I summoned the courage to descend. Each step felt like an eternity. The sounds grew clearer, more deliberate, like deliberate footsteps echoing through the silence. Panic surged through me, urging me to turn back, to retreat to the safety of my room. But something held me captive, an inexplicable need to uncover the truth. The lower floor greeted me with an unseen presence. I moved cautiously, my breath hitching at every unfamiliar sound. The living room stood empty, the curtains drawn tight against the outside light. I dared to peek into the kitchen, my heart pounding in my ears. Nothing. The rooms were as still as a photograph, frozen in time. Then, a muffled thud echoed through the house, distant yet unmistakable. It was coming from the direction of my mother's bedroom. Dread gripped me, threatening to pull me under, but my feet moved of their own accord. As I approached my mother's room, my heart began to pound uncontrollably, my breath caught in my throat. What I saw next would give me nightmares for years to come. Standing in my mother's room was a towering figure. His silhouette was tall and broad. The details of his face were obscured. But his eyes were visible, gleaming with an unsettling intensity, and staring directly into mine. Time seemed to stretch and warp around us. The weight of the moment pressed down on me like an oppressive force. My pulse thundered in my ears, drowning out even the faintest whisper of a sound. We stood there, eyes locked, a battle of wills that seemed to span an eternity. Then, with deliberate purpose, he took a step forward, the floorboards groaning beneath his weight. A scream tore from my lips, an instinctual response to the encroaching danger. I raced back upstairs, fear gripping me. The belief that he was coming for me clung to my thoughts like a suffocating shroud. In one fluid motion, I hurtled through the threshold of my bedroom doorway the momentum carrying me forward. Behind me, the door slammed shut with a resounding bang, sealing off the unknown presence that lurked on the other side of it. Panic surged through me, urging me to find shelter, to hide from the unseen threat that had breached the sanctity of my home. My eyes darted around the room, searching for a place of refuge, a stronghold to weather the storm of terror. Without hesitation, I lunged towards the closet, fingers fumbling to grasp the handle. The door swung open, revealing a narrow, confined space. In my haste, I squeezed myself inside, the scent of familiar clothes and shoes enveloping me. I shut the door and the darkness swallowed me whole, the confines of the closet providing a false sense of safety. I heard a thud, then another. I pressed my back against the closet wall, willing my breaths to steady. The seconds stretched into an agonizing crawl, time slowing as I waited, every nerve on edge, and then... Nothing. Only complete silence. I sat, motionless, straining with all my might to catch hold of any sound. But there was only silence. Minutes felt like hours. The silence oppressive, broken only by the steady rhythm of my breaths. The tension was unbearable, a suffocating weight on my chest. And then, just as quickly as the sounds had faded, they returned. 
Disbelief washed over me. I had thought the intruder had left. I could hear the footsteps approaching, ascending the stairs. As the footsteps drew closer, a terrifying thought pierced straight through my heart. In my haste to make for the closet, I had forgotten to lock the bedroom door. I pressed my trembling hands against the fabric of my clothes, a futile attempt to silence the involuntary tremors that had taken hold of me. Then, the creak of my bedroom door sent fresh waves of terror coursing through me. Tears welled in my eyes, but I bit my lip to stifle any sound. Footsteps drew nearer, each one echoing like a death knell. The sounds of movement and activity reached a fever pitch, filling the air with a chaotic symphony. It was a haunting contrast to the oppressive silence that had reigned just moments before. My heart raced, pounding against my ribs like a desperate plea for escape. I could hardly believe it. My tormentor was still present, refusing to yield to the passage of time. I was frozen, a statue of fear. My senses heightened to a painful intensity. The footsteps drew nearer, each one a menacing cadence that seemed to reverberate through the room. I pressed myself further into the closet, willing the darkness to swallow me whole. Then, with agonizing slowness, the doorknob turned, the door inching open. My breath caught in my throat, my eyes squeezed shut in a desperate bid for invisibility. It was the moment of truth. As the door swung open, a shaft of light pierced the darkness, illuminating the cramped confines of my hiding place. It was my mother, her face etched with concern and relief. She had come home early from work, her presence a beacon of salvation in the midst of my terror. She rushed towards me, her arms enveloping me in a tight embrace. I could feel her heart beating against my own, a reassuring rhythm that anchored me to reality. She asked what was wrong, her voice a soothing balm against the chaos that had unfolded. I recounted the harrowing encounter, each word a tremor in the stillness. Her grip on me tightened, a silent promise of protection and reassurance. With unwavering resolve, she reached for her phone, dialing the numbers to report the intrusion. The police were on their way, determined to unravel the mystery of the man in the shadows. An investigation ensued, casting its net wide, but the intruder proved as elusive as smoke in the wind, leaving behind no trace, no clue to unravel the mystery. It was as if he had never truly been there, a phantom slipping through the fingers of those who sought him. With each passing day, the initial shock and fear began to ebb, replaced by a lingering unease. Our home, once a sanctuary, bore the weight of that day's terror in its very foundation. Every creak and whisper seemed to carry an echo of that chilling presence. Yet, amidst the shadows of fear, there emerged a beacon of strength. My mother's love shone brightly, a steadfast pillar of support and protection. Her determination to keep us safe was unwavering, a testament to the fierce resilience of a mother's heart. Story 3. The Light in Mrs. Jackson's Room This is one of the craziest stories you'll ever hear. It happened to me about 11 years ago. It was around 1.30 a.m. and I was making my way down the hall of a nursing home. I was a maintenance man and was doing some work in the kitchen. I needed to get it done overnight so that the kitchen would be available for regular operation during the day. Anyways, I was walking down a hall back to the kitchen after retrieving some tools from my truck. As I passed one of the rooms, its light suddenly flicked on. I paused, stepped back a bit, and peered inside. When I looked inside, a couple of things felt off. An old woman was sitting quietly in a chair, staring at the wall. It was peculiar because the room was nearly empty. It only really had the chair that she was sitting in, a bed, and not much else. The second thing that felt weird is that as old and fragile as the woman looked, it was odd to me that she was able to flick on the light and get in the chair so quickly. I noticed too that her bed was completely made, not a wrinkle on it. Rather than knocking on the door or saying anything to the old woman, I felt like it wasn't my place. I was a maintenance man there to do a job and not be concerned with the affairs of the residents. Instead, I continued walking down the hall and notified a staff member. The staff member and I looked back down the hall together only to see that the room was dark again. At this point, confusion was really starting to set in. The fifth door on the right, I said to the staff member. 
Mrs. Jackson's room? She asked. I looked at her and said that I had no idea because I had no idea who Mrs. Jackson was. We walked down to the room together and the staff member flicked on the lights. There was nobody there. The room was completely empty. Are you sure it was this room? The staff member asked. Yes, I said. There was an old woman sitting in that chair and she was just staring at that wall and the lights were on. Finally, the staff member looked at me and said, This is Mrs. Jackson's room. She died two days ago. I literally felt my blood run cold. Are you sure? I asked. Yes, she said. We both just stood there and looked at each other. It was like both of us were trying to process what each of us was saying to each other. Finally, I didn't know what else to do or say, so I just said that I was going to finish up in the kitchen, and we both went our separate ways. I finished up and got out of there before the kitchen crew made their way in the next morning. About four months later, I ran into that staff member at a Walmart. You know, she said, after you went back to the kitchen, I checked the security cameras. My eyes got really wide. You were right. You walked past that door and the lights came on. After you walked away, they went back off. I was in shock. I knew I wasn't seeing things. It didn't show anything in the room, but from the view of the hallway, it definitely shows that the lights came on and then went off, she said. I think we were both already freaked out, so I didn't say anything to you about it that night. To this day, I can't explain what happened, but I know what I saw. There was an old woman in that chair, and according to the staff member, that old woman was no longer alive. Story 4, Emma's Friend Moving to an old farmhouse in Lockwood, Missouri was supposed to be a fresh start for our family of four. After my husband lost his job, the sudden inheritance of the property from his great aunt seemed like a serendipitous gift. The land sprawled over a couple of acres, with the house looking like something out of an old-time movie, complete with a rickety fence and a swing set in the backyard. The moment we moved in, little Emma, our three-year-old, was drawn to that swing set like a moth to a flame. I remember her excited shouts, Mom! Look! A swing! We laughed, letting her tire herself out as she merrily pushed her imaginary friend on the swing. It was harmless, we thought. Within days, she started referring to her imaginary friend as the little girl. At breakfast, she'd narrate tales of how the little girl used to live in our house and would play on the swing every day. Honestly, we were more impressed by her creativity than concerned. Kids do have vivid imaginations, after all. But then, strange things started happening. One morning, I walked into the kitchen and found all the chairs overturned. When I asked Emma, she shrugged and whispered, The little girl did it. She's unhappy. I assumed Emma was testing boundaries, a phase perhaps. However, our stay in Lockwood quickly devolved from peaceful to eerie. Lights would suddenly flicker, doors would slam unexpectedly. On one unsettling evening, as I made my way to the basement to fetch some old toys, the door slammed behind me. I wrestled with the knob but found myself trapped. It felt like forever down there until my husband heard my panicked shouts and rescued me. Emma, looking up from her drawing, simply remarked, she doesn't want you here. As days passed, my earlier amusement with Emma's tales turned to dread. My eldest son, Mike, also grew wary. He confessed to hearing footsteps outside his room at night. Yet, it was an incident with my husband that convinced us something was very wrong. It was a crisp morning, and I watched from the kitchen as he walked upstairs. Minutes later, I heard a horrified scream and a thud. Turning around, I found him sprawled at the foot of the staircase, clutching his leg. He looked at me, terror in his eyes. Someone pushed me, I swear. It was then that our attempts to rationalize everything ceased. We decided to dig deeper into the history of the house. The town's local librarian helped us find old newspaper clippings about the property. A chilling revelation awaited us. Seventy years ago, a young girl had tragically passed away in a house fire right where our home stood. She loved playing on the swing set. We couldn't ignore the signs any longer. Even Emma became withdrawn, repeatedly saying, The little girl is unhappy that we're living in her house. But nothing could have prepared us for one fateful night. Awoken by a strong smell of smoke, we found the house engulfed in flames. Panic set in. Racing to Emma's room, we found her calmly sitting on her bed. I warned you, 
she whispered. The little girl said it's too late. Desperately, we tried to exit, but none of the doors would budge. It's like they were all locked from the outside, trapping us in. The heat intensified and our hope dwindled. But in that dire moment, adrenaline kicked in. My husband, in a Herculean effort, shattered a living room window with a chair, creating an escape route. The cold night air was a stark contrast to the scalding heat inside. We watched our supposed fresh start turn to ashes. The haunting silhouette of the swing set was the only thing left unscathed in the backyard. As dawn broke, we decided unanimously we wouldn't return. Whatever memories the house held, they weren't ours to keep. We were just grateful to have made it out alive. Today, all that remains of our short stay in Lockwood is scarred memories and Emma's innocent words. She doesn't want you here. If only we had listened sooner. Story 5. The Mysterious Tent The following is a story that happened to me and my friends about four years ago. My friends Alex and Chris and I headed to a remote part of the Sierra Nevada to go camping and fishing. We had been in this spot before and very much enjoyed it, so we decided to go back and make a weekend of it. Well, I wouldn't be telling this story if something incredibly creepy didn't happen. We had trekked deep into the forest to our spot. We loved it because we would be far from anybody else. Just the three of us, and the serene beauty of nature, that type of thing, you know? On the second day, we set out to go fishing. All was well. We traveled up the river some and had a blast. A few hours before sunset, we decided that we should get back so that we could get a fire going before dark. When we got back to the campsite, we noticed that there was another tent oddly close to ours. Uncomfortably close maybe 75 to 80 feet away. It was a plain old tent, with no other camping equipment in sight. Our first impressions were ones of annoyance. We were out in the middle of nowhere, and of all the places that someone could throw up a tent, they do it here, right next to ours. Out of courtesy, though, we approached the tent, calling out a greeting. No response. We called again, and again, nothing. It appeared that no one was there. Finally, Chris came across and said that he was going to take a look inside. Best not, I said. But before I could even finish, he was making his way over. He walked over, slowly and cautiously. When he reached the door, he slowly unzipped it. What do you see? Alex asked. Nothing, Chris replied. What do you mean? I said. I mean, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing inside. We were all confused, but assumed the occupant was out exploring or something. So we went about our day, trying to shrug off the unease. It got darker, and darker, and darker. As we went about our business, we kept making glances over at the tent, expecting someone to show up at some point. We had gotten lost in our own affairs when out of nowhere, a light flicked on from the inside of the tent. Inside was the silhouette of a single person that we could see. We all looked at each other. Nobody ever saw anybody walk over and into the tent. At this point, the creepiness was off the charts. We didn't expect for things to get any creepier, but they did. Go say something, Chris said to me. What do you want me to say? I asked. I don't know, he said. Anything. I hesitated but finally gave in. I walked over slowly, watching the silhouette the entire time. It was motionless, just sitting there in the middle of the tent doing nothing. I got closer and closer. My heart was pounding out of my chest. When I got within about 15 feet, just as I was about to speak up, I could see the head of this person, or whatever it was, begin to turn slowly, like it was looking over in my direction. I looked back at the guys and they were motioning for me to continue. I turned back towards the tent, and just as I was about to speak out, a blood-curdling scream came from within the tent. Before I could even realize it, I had turned and was running back towards the guys. We were all in a panic at this point. What just happened? Who was this person? What in the hell is going on? We argued amongst ourselves, frantically trying to decide what to do. As we did, I reached into my pocket to grab my phone. Zero reception. Not even a single bar. It was the dead of night now. We were out in the middle of nowhere, had no cell phone reception, and there was a mysterious tent 75 feet away from us with an unknown occupant that had let out a scream like none of us had ever heard before. 
we were absolutely terrified. As we argued about what to do, there was motion from within the tent. The silhouette appeared to be looking in our direction still, though it was difficult to tell. It said nothing. Then, after a few seconds, it looked like this person was raising their arm up to the top of the tent. We were all wide-eyed, locked into the motion coming from within the tent. And then, out of nowhere, the light inside the tent went out. What in the hell? What in the hell? We were all saying to each other. Questions were flying, but we had no answers. None of us knew what to do. We had gear and supplies and tents everywhere, and we were miles from our vehicle. We went back and forth trying to figure out what to do. Finally, we decided that we would go ahead and stay the night, and wait until daylight to try to make sense out of everything. From there, we would just leave altogether, if the unknown person had not yet made contact with us. However, we would take shifts with one of us staying awake to watch over the creepy visitor. Keep the fire going, I said. The other two agreed. Alex was first up. At around 1 a.m., Alex woke up Chris. As they told me, they switched shifts with no new events taking place. As far as they knew, the weird person was still in the tent. Surprisingly, I managed to get some sleep. It wasn't enough, though. Chris woke me up at 4 a.m., and I was to take over until daylight. As Alex crawled into his tent, I threw more wood on the fire. I remember sitting there, wide awake at first. The fire was nice. It provided some comfort, in contrast to our unknown visitor. I remember watching the tent for any movement. Nothing. I would watch the fire for a little while, and then look over at the tent. I did this over, and over, and over. I remember getting more and more tired. After about an hour or so, I was struggling to stay awake. I would doze off, just to catch myself, and then doze off again. Finally, fatigue won over, and I fell asleep. The next thing I remember is that it was daylight and Chris was shaking me. Wake up, what the hell? He said. Where did the person go? I looked over to the mysterious tent. There was nothing. It was gone. You fell asleep? Chris said in somewhat of an annoyed voice. At this point, Alex was making his way out of his tent. Where'd they go? He said. I don't know, I replied. We searched for any sign of the person. There was nothing. Not even footprints. It was like they were never there in the first place. At this point, we had enough. It was daylight now, so we began to pack our things. We weren't going to wait around to see if the person returned. We were exhausted when we arrived back home. It was a trip that we will never forget. To this day, we have no idea who the person was, or what their intentions were. Was it some sick prank? Was someone trying to scare us off of the spot for good? Unfortunately, we may never know. We never went back to that spot again. It's a shame. It was one of our favorites. But I guess the fear of the unknown visitor was enough to keep us away for good. Story 6. The New Guy in the Neighborhood A few years back, I moved into the house I'm living in now. At the time, it was a new development. It was one of those places where they planned to fill up the street with homes, but so far, it was just me and one other house across the street and a couple of lots down. The rest were just empty lots, which gave the whole street a kind of eerie, unfinished feel. One night, shortly after I moved in, I was reading a book in my bedroom when I decided to go to the kitchen to grab a drink of water. As I was drinking, I glanced out the front window and noticed some light coming from the direction of the neighbor's house. I hadn't met the neighbor yet, but knew that someone lived there. I joked to my friends that I was the new guy in the neighborhood even though it was just me and the person across the street. Peering through the window, I could just make out a car parked outside, and what looked like a figure standing at the front door. It was too dark, and the figure was too far away to see any details, but I assumed it was my neighbor. I watched for a short time, but after little activity, I didn't think much of it, finished my water, and headed back to bed. Back in my room, I dove back into my book, but after about five minutes or so, a noise from the front of the house caught my attention. It was a subtle sound at first, so I brushed it off and tried to focus on my reading. I figured I was imagining things, telling myself that these new houses sometimes settle and make strange noises. But the noise didn't stop. In fact, it got louder. I rationalized to myself that it might be an animal, maybe a raccoon. 
Feeling a mix of annoyance and unease, I got up to check it out. I crept down the hallway, not wanting to turn on the lights just yet, thinking maybe I could catch a glimpse of what it was. I angled myself at my front window to try to get a look at my front door, but it was too dark to see anything. As I backed away from the window, though, I looked back over at my neighbor's house. The car was still there, but the person at the front door was gone. That's when the noise at my door got louder, more insistent. It had to be a raccoon, I thought to myself. I quietly inched my way over to the door. Without thinking much further, I switched on the porch light and yanked the door open at the same time, ready to confront a small animal. But it wasn't a raccoon. It was a man, right there on my doorstep, his hand frozen midair, reaching for my screen door. We locked eyes, and for a moment, neither of us moved. The guy looked rough, wild-eyed, and desperate, like he was running on something more than just adrenaline. He had a look of surprise on his face, as I'm sure I did as well. Both of us stood there, as if each of us was calculating our next move. Suddenly, he reached for the screen door and started shaking it violently, as if he had made his decision and was trying to tear it open. I slammed the door shut, heart pounding in my chest, and yelled through the door that I was calling the cops. As I backpedaled, I could see him through the window, running into the front yard, pausing for a second as if considering his options, then running back to the car in the neighbor's driveway. It was then that I realized that the car and man across the street wasn't my neighbor, but a man trying to get into my neighbor's house. I called the police, and they came out pretty quickly, but by then, the guy was long gone. They took my statement and did a quick check around the house and the neighbors. The man, whoever it was, had broken into my neighbor's house and then made his way over to mine. I would later find out that luckily, my neighbor wasn't at home and was on vacation at the time. The cops said they'd keep an eye on the neighborhood, but I never got word back that the man had been caught. I installed some extra locks and a security system after that. I even met the neighbors when they got back. We talked about the incident and they were as shaken up about it as I was. Like me, they installed cameras to beef up the security around their property. Since that time, the neighborhood has grown now. Most of the lots have been developed, and it feels more like a community than it did before, when it was just my neighbor and me. That night was a terrifying night to say the least, and I'm just glad that no one got hurt. It was an experience that I'll never forget, and so far, it is the only bad one I've ever had in my new home. Hopefully it stays that way. Story 7. The Manager's Warnings I remember it clearly. The day I walked into that job interview for the night security guard position at a local department store. It was supposed to be a straightforward job. Something to fill the nights and pad the wallet. The store was an old structure, with walls that held decades of commerce. The manager, an old man with eyes full of years of experience, seemed almost reluctant to hire me. As we sat across from each other in the break room, the smell of stale coffee hanging in the air, he laid it out straight. We've had a few... incidents, he said, his voice lowering as if the very walls around us could hear. Movement, shadows, things that fall off shelves with no explanation, and sounds, strange sounds that don't belong. Nobody has ever been hurt, but for some, it's a little bit too much to handle. I raised an eyebrow. So the place is haunted, huh? I asked, chuckling a little bit. He didn't smile. Instead, he offered a nod. Believe what you will, but I feel like it's my duty to tell you beforehand. I wasn't a believer in such things. I'd outgrown the fear of the dark. I didn't believe that monsters, ghosts, and goblins were hiding in the shadows. So I accepted the job, my chuckle masking the tiny flicker of doubt that maybe, just maybe, I was stepping into something I couldn't control. The first night arrived, and with it, a sense of nervousness I hadn't expected. The store was different at night, devoid of the comforting hustle of daytime activity. It was just me, my heavy boots echoing on the linoleum floors the hum of the fluorescent lights above, and the silent atmosphere of a thousand unsold goods watching me. I took my post at the security desk, a tiny island in a sea of shadows. Monitors flickered with the black and white ghosts of empty aisles and mannequins dressed in the latest fashions. 
It was on these screens that I first saw it. A flicker of movement that had no source. A flutter that could have been a trick of the light, but felt like so much more. I tried to ignore it, to immerse myself in the routine checks of the cameras, the sip of lukewarm coffee, the flip through a worn magazine. But it felt like the store was watching me with eyes that seemed to come from the very bones of the building. It was when I heard a clatter, a sound like metal on tile, that my resolve began to crumble. I found myself drawn into the heart of the store, my flashlight cutting a swathe through the darkness. The aisles were vast, the shelves towering above me like silent lookouts. There, in the middle of the floor, lay a toy, a small metal car. It was completely out of place, just laying there, like it had been placed there. I told myself it was nothing, just something that had fallen off the shelf. No big deal. I bent down to pick it up. As I placed it back onto the shelf, a cold tingle ran over my skin. I tried to laugh it off, chiding myself for letting the manager's earlier warning get into my head. Settling back into my post, all was quiet for a short time. But then, out of nowhere, the lights began to flicker. I could feel it. I was alone, but not alone. It felt like someone, or something, was studying me. I felt like I needed reassurance, a way to prove to myself that it was all in my head. So, I returned to the floor of the department store seeking out something that would provide me with the reassurance that I needed. That's when I saw the balloons, a cluster of them tied to an end cap, bobbing gently in the air that I was now acutely aware had no current. With bravado I didn't feel, I issued my challenge to the empty store. If there's something here, some spirit or ghost, then pop one of those balloons. I waited, my heart pounding in a frantic rhythm. I stared at the balloons, listening, waiting, after a moment, I felt like the reassurance I was seeking had arrived. There was nothing. Only silence. Wiping a thin layer of sweat off of my forehead, I gave myself a chuckle and started walking back towards my post. Before I could pivot, though, there was a sudden explosion from one of the balloons. It was as sudden as a lightning strike. The sound of the burst was deafening in the quiet, like a cannon blast that reverberated through the aisles and off the shelves. In that instant, my courage shattered. I didn't hesitate, didn't stop for anything. I left my post, the store, the job, all behind in a heart-pounding sprint for the door. I didn't even bother to lock it behind me. I never went back, not even to explain. But I don't think any explanation was needed. It's a situation I feel that the manager of the store has encountered before. It wasn't his first, and I certainly don't think that it'll be his last. For a few nights after that incident, I'd wake up in a cold sweat, that single loud pop still echoing in my ears. I tell myself it was just a balloon, that it was the pressure or a defect that made it burst. But in the dark of the night, when the world is silent and still, I wonder if I had been too quick to dismiss the manager's warnings. Story 8 Apartment 407. Moving to the heart of the city had always been a dream for Clara and me. After months of searching, we finally settled on a nice apartment complex in the downtown area. The apartment had nice amenities like a rooftop garden, a state-of-the-art gym, and a spacious pool area. Our apartment, on the fourth floor, was a sprawling two-bedroom space with floor-to-ceiling windows and a nice view of the pool below. The floor, we were told, only had a handful of tenants. That didn't bother us much. One of those tenants, however, seemed to be a mystery to us. Apartment 407, right next to us, appeared to house someone. We'd often hear footsteps in the corridor, and the sound of the door opening and closing. But by the time we'd peek through our peephole, there would be no one there. One evening, while Clara was trying out a new recipe in our kitchen, an eerie moaning echoed from 407. It sounded like a blend of pain and sorrow a sound that really gave us the chills. Concerned for our unseen neighbor, I decided to check on him. Stepping out, I knocked on the door. As soon as my knuckles made contact, the moaning stopped. I waited, feeling the weight of the silence, but no answer came. Hello? I said. Is everything okay? There was no response. Days passed, and the events of that evening weighed on my mind. 
Clara and I would at times press our ears up against the wall and would hear footsteps and mumbling coming from the next apartment over. Trying to shake everything off, we focused on settling into our new life. We frequented the gym, dined at the nearby gourmet restaurants, and spent lazy afternoons by the complex's nice pool. One evening, as we lounged by that pool, Clara suddenly tapped me on my leg. Look, she whispered, discreetly motioning with her head upwards. Following her gaze, I saw a shadowy figure standing behind the sheer curtain of apartment 407. But in the blink of an eye, it disappeared. The sight was so fleeting that I would have dismissed it as a trick of the light had Clara not seen it too. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I decided to speak with the apartment manager, Mrs. Patterson. She was a sweet woman in her fifties, with silver streaks in her hair and a perpetual warm smile. Upon inquiring about the tenant of 407, her expression turned from one of casual interest to confusion. No one's been living in 407 for several weeks, she said, her voice laced with genuine surprise. I relayed our strange experiences to her, the sounds, the silhouette, the eerie moaning. Mrs. Patterson, now visibly concerned, decided to accompany me to the apartment. As we approached the wooden door of 407, those all too familiar murmurs met our ears. Mrs. Patterson hesitated, then knocked. Instantly the sound ceased. She knocked again. Nothing. No sounds and no answer. With a heightened look of confusion on her face, she unlocked the door. The apartment was a stark contrast to ours. While our unit was filled with life, love, and warmth, 407 was cold and desolate. There was nothing there. No furniture, no belongings, and no person. Just a single sheer curtain covering the living room window. There was no sign of recent occupancy at all. Mrs. Patterson, her face pale, relayed the tragic history of the apartment. Mr. Applegate, a solitary elderly man, had been its tenant for years. Known for his reclusive habits, he rarely ventured out. Tragically, he had suffered a fatal fall in the apartment. It appeared that he had tripped, his head taking a blow on the counter before coming to rest on the floor. His agonized moans eventually alerted a neighbor down the hall, but help arrived too late, and Mr. Applegate passed away right there, before the ambulance could arrive. These events, she said, happened about three weeks before we moved in. The weight of what Mrs. Patterson was telling me was immense. How could this be? The sounds, the footsteps, the moans. Someone had to be in that apartment, but there was no one. As I later relayed the revelation to Clara, I could see the blood run out of her face. That's impossible, she said. We're always hearing noises from that apartment. I know, I said back to her. But the manager told me that there's been no one in that apartment for weeks, not since Mr. Applegate died. Deciding that this was a little bit too much for us to handle, we requested to be moved to a different room and floor. Mrs. Patterson, out of the kindness of her heart, accepted and moved us to the sixth floor. Life has resumed its rhythm in our new space. No noises, no footsteps, no murmurs or moans. Sometimes though, while enjoying the sunset by the pool, Clara and I find our eyes drifting up to that window. Every so often, I swear, you can still catch a glimpse of someone walking around in apartment 407. Story 9. A Night at Cry Baby Bridge. You know, every town has its legends. Those tales that parents use to scare their kids into behaving, or stories teenagers dare each other to explore. In my small town, just three miles northwest of Monmouth, Illinois, we had the Cry Baby Bridge. For as long as I can remember, older kids would tell us the gruesome tale of the school bus tragedy at the bridge. It was said that many years ago, during a particularly harsh rainstorm, an elementary school bus, filled with innocent children, met its doom there. A sudden flash flood washed the bridge out, and the bus, unable to stop in time, plunged off the side. Every single child on board was claimed by the raging waters, but that's not the end of the story. Legend says that the spirits of those kids never left. It was rumored that if you positioned your car at the start of the bridge precisely at midnight and placed it into neutral, those same children would muster their ethereal strength to push your vehicle across. And if you were brave, or perhaps foolish, enough to sprinkle baby powder on your bumper, 
you'd see their tiny handprints as proof of their presence. My friends and I, we never really bought into the legend. Maybe because we thought we were too rational, too logical. But on Halloween night in 2006, a part of us wanted to see if there was any truth to it. We decided to take Mark's Jeep, big enough to fit all four of us, and old enough that we wouldn't be devastated if it got a scratch or two. As we approached the bridge, we shared light-hearted banter, laughing off our mild anxieties. The clock ticked closer to midnight. Following the ritual as we had heard it, I sprinkled baby powder all over the Jeep's bumper. We all inspected it, making sure every inch was covered, half expecting to see some marks already. But there was nothing, just the smooth white powder. Mark, in a dramatic fashion, aligned the Jeep at the start of the bridge. He placed the car into neutral and revved the engine, heightening our heart rates. Then we sat and waited for something, anything. Minutes felt like hours. Nothing happened. We all started laughing, chastising ourselves for even thinking this could be real. I remember my friend Sarah joking about how she'd have a better chance finding a ghost in her attic. We were on the brink of giving up, labeling this as another failed adventure when it began. It started as a faint, distant sobbing. Is that a baby? Mark whispered, but the sound grew evolving into multiple cries, a mixture of countless voices, each one louder and more distressed than the last. Our chuckles died down instantly. Suddenly the jeep lurched forward. It was subtle at first, like when you think you've forgotten to put your car in park. But then, it quickly gained momentum. The wheels rolled over the old tarmac, and the once distant cries now sounded like they were right inside our car. My heart raced, every cry penetrating my ears, every sob tearing at my soul. In our panic, none of us thought to stop the car. It felt like we were in the clutches of an unseen force, hurtling us with increasing speed towards the other side of the bridge. Our laughter had been replaced with screams, our skepticism with pure, unadulterated terror. The jeep accelerated quickly, faster and faster, until with one final jolt, it came to a halt, having crashed into the protective barrier on the other side of the bridge. We sat there for a moment trying to process what had just happened. Our breaths were ragged, our hands shaking. As the reality of our situation sank in, we slowly stepped out, inspecting the jeep for damage. That's when we saw them. On the baby-powdered bumper were dozens of tiny handprints, clear against the white backdrop. Handprints of children who had met their untimely end on that very bridge. The undeniable proof was right there in front of our eyes. We hopped back into the jeep and drove back into town. It was quiet the entire way back. Honestly, I think we were all just too shaken to say much. Even now, years after the event, we reflect back and try to come to terms with it. The four of us don't talk about that night much. The weight of it hangs on us. I'm sharing this now, not as a dare or challenge, but as a warning. Some legends, no matter how unbelievable they seem, hold a grain of truth. Crybaby Bridge is real. Those children, they're still there, waiting. If you ever find yourself in Monmouth and hear the tale of Crybaby Bridge, remember our story. Respect the legend, and whatever you do, don't venture there at midnight. Story 10, Nature's Call. I've been a trucker most of my life, been many places, seen many things, and experienced many more. Everything I can ever recount about my time on the road pales in comparison to this one encounter I had a few years ago in the middle of nowhere. It was my own fault, really. I'd been downing coffee like water in the desert, and it was about time to pay the piper. My bladder was sending out SOS signals, and I knew there wasn't a chance in hell I'd make it to the next truck stop. I was in a real fix, caught between a rock and a hard place. Deciding that it was now or never, I saw an off-ramp in the distance and made a beeline for it, pulling off and onto the shoulder. As my truck hissed to a stop, I saw a man standing on the bridge ahead, illuminated by the moonlight. He was just standing there, still as could be, looking in the other direction. At first, I wasn't overly concerned about the man. He seemed to pay me no attention, and he was far enough away that I felt like he really wasn't a threat, even though it was late at night out in the middle of nowhere. 
I'll be honest too that at the time, the most important thing on my mind was making my way out of the truck to answer nature's call. So, I climbed down from my cab, trying to act like I hadn't seen him, skirted around the front of the truck, and made my way over to the passenger side to handle my business. The relief was much needed. As I finished up, I could hear something, coming from the distance. For a minute, I was like a deer in the woods, completely motionless so that I could get a better gauge on the sound that I was hearing. It was footsteps, but not just footsteps, it was the sound of someone running. As I made my way back around the front of the truck, the man who had moments ago paid me no attention was running dead at me and my truck. He wasn't just running though, he was in an all-out sprint. I didn't know what was going on and I didn't want to stick around to find out. I hustled back into the truck, the alarm bells in my head blasting as loud as they could go. I locked the doors the moment I was inside, and then, as if he was possessed by a demon or something, the man was suddenly on the step of my rig, pounding on the window with a crazed look plastered across his face, shouting, Open up! I need a ride! My blood ran cold. Everything happened so fast that I didn't even have time to process what was going on. Summoning up what little bit of wits I still had about me, I shouted out at him to get the hell off my truck. I wasn't about to play hero to some midnight lunatic. He didn't move, just kept hammering on the window, his eyes desperate. Then he was off, running around to the passenger side before I could even think. He was up on the step again, slamming his fists against the window, screaming about needing that ride. Panic overcame every inch of me. I started the rig the engine roaring to life as I hit the gas, hoping he'd take the hint and bail. He did, jumping off just as the truck started to pick up speed. As the rig made its way down the road, I checked the mirrors but couldn't see a thing. It was too dark, and I had no idea where he went. As I drove on, a terrible thought raced through my mind. What if he never got off the truck? What if he latched on somewhere where I couldn't see him? Would he come after me after I finally stopped? I hopped on the dial and barked out my situation, pleading for the cops as I kept the rig rolling, my eyes flicking between the road and the mirrors. When the cops showed up, their lights were a swirl of red and blue that cut through the night. Never in my life would I have ever thought that I'd be relieved to see cop lights flashing in my mirrors. I pulled over, and together we scoured the truck, checking every possible hidey hole and shadow where the man might have slipped into. But there was nothing, no trace of him. The cops gave me that look, the kind that said they thought I was just seeing things, but I knew what I'd seen. I hit the road again as soon as they left, but I wasn't the same. I couldn't forget the look of that man's crazed face just outside my window, inches from mine, glaring at me in a possessed rage. I never found out who that person was, or why he came at me the way that he did. It was a terrifying experience, one that I'll never forget and one that took many years to put behind me.